Hello. This quick 15 minute presentation will focus on how to keep computer memory storage requirements to a minimum when you're doing your two flow flood modeling. To give you a little bit of background, uh, we recently received a few support queries that from clients who were doing modeling and ultimately creating um, result data sets that were excessively large. So we've created this webinar just to showcase a variety of ways to reduce your result folder memory footprint. Uh, let's see, there's there's four different test cases here, all using the same model. We're reducing the file site, foot, the result folder memory footprint from 98 gigabytes down to less than one gigabyte. That's a pretty massive reduction. To start with, I'll tell you a little bit bit about the model we've used, been we have used for the testing. Uh, it's 60 kilometers long, 30 kilometers wide. It uses a 60 meter grid resolution, which translates to 300,000 active cells. And the event which we've modeled has run for 140 hours. We need somewhere to start. Uh, this will be the base case for us. We ran the model using TUFA HPC uh, and GPU hardware. The model took one hour 14 to run. It produced 2,600 result files with a collective footprint of 98 gigabytes. Now both of those numbers are excessively large. Having looked at the output controls that were used to define what results should be written and how they should be written, uh, you can see here that we have water level, velocity and depth output in DAT and ASCII format at a 600 second in interval or 10 minute interval. Let's just go to our result folder. If you go into the grids folder you'll see that we have thousands upon thousands of ASC files every 10 minutes for each of those output types velocity, board level and depth. Now since we're also writing this exact same data to the DAT file which is a more efficient binary file format, these files are completely unnecessary. For that reason, I'd recommend whenever you're writing ASCII output, don't write their um, time varying results, or don't use the ASCII format for time varying results, um, only use it for maximums. And you can turn off the time varying results by using the command ASC map output interval equals equals zero. How does that change the numbers when we add that single command? Uh, let's see, instead of 2,600 result files, we have 62. Instead of around 100 gigabytes worth of results, we're down to 4.6 gigabytes. So it's a 95% reduction. It's pretty significant. If we look in the version 2 folder in grids now, you'll see that we just have maximum results in ASCII format. All the time varying results are contained in the DAT files, which is a much more efficient way to store it. Uh, at this point, it's actually worth mentioning that these maximum results are tracked on a computational time step basis during the simulation. The map output interval that you specify won't affect them at all. But what if you actually wanted results in ASCII format for a given time. That's where you can use two photo GIS to post process those results from the DAT or XMDF file format. If you don't know how to do that already, I recommend pausing this presentation and going to the link at the bottom there, and you'll be able to read up on how to do that. Uh, the next thing I'd like to show you is the difference between the DAT format and the XMDF format. XMDF was introduced probably around about six or seven years ago. And it's an alternative to that, which is um, has a greater compression ratio, so we should see the file sizes reduce. Let's see. So we, if we compare our numbers here, you can see that the number of result files is reduced down to 58, and the file size is down at 3.1 gigs from 4.6, which is a 30% reduction. Functionally, what's changed? If we go into our result folder in the DAT format, 
a single file is written for each result type, so velocity, depth, water level. If we go to version 3, which used the XMDF format, you'll see it. <coughs> all those three results are actually consolidated into the one file, the XMDF file. Um, yes, yeah, so you do see less, a smaller number of files, but more importantly, the file size collectively is smaller too. Uh, let's see. The next thing that I noticed when I looked at this model was that the map output interval was originally specified to 600 seconds, which translates to a lot of results when you're doing, running a model for 140 hours. So I've increased that up to 3,600. If we run that model, you can see that it sees a further 75% reduction in result folder file size, uh, going from 3.1 gigs down to 0.8. That does beg the question though, what is an appropriate number for your map output interval? And I typically find that something that translates to approximately 100 output increments is sufficient for most projects. Um, if you are modelling or running a project that has to deal with multiple durations, that's where you would really benefit from specifying this map output interval command in your two-flow event file so you can define it at a unique value for each event duration and it'll automate that way TUFO will automatically assign the right interval depending on the length of your event. Uh, the only time where this 100 um, output increment recommendation is varied is it's really when I'm creating animations if I want to get a really nice smooth animation I would increase the number of increments or ultimately decrease this output interval to a smaller number. When I set that number to a higher value such as I have here, I usually put a lot of thought into where I define my plot output features as well. Now these are specific points or flux lines in the model where you'd like to extract time varying results at a, a finer increment, so here we're specifying them at a 600 second increment. Now there's a lot of value in doing that before you run your models. Let's have a look at this model and just see how the results um, look with that one hour output increment. I'm just using the two flow viewer here. Let's see, we'll load the results over the DEM. We'll look at the depth results and I'll just step through this manually by clicking the forward button in the time slider. That way we can see with each hour how much the flood wave progresses. I mean, it's a little bit staggered but for the sake of the model developer getting a sense of the flood behaviour and also um, just quality checking the model, it's more than sufficient. But when it comes to analysing results, it may not be fine enough and that's where the plot output comes into play. Now I'll load in a plot output and you'll see there'll be a whole load of points and lines specified in this model. And in those locations I'm using a 600 second output increment. So if we just click on the plot point, I select one of these points. Now you can see the graph down the very left hand side of the window here has been updated with that higher resolution time increment plot value for that particular location. But like I said, you can see there's a load of lines and points throughout this entire model domain where I've predefined where I'd like those high resolution results. The next thing that I'd like to bring your attention to is the concept of defining unique grid output types relative to your mesh, XMDF or DAT file types. Here you can see I'm outputting ASCII files for water level, velocity, depth, Z hazard, oh sorry, Z naught, um, the Melbourne water hazard, the cumulative rainfall and cumulative infiltration. Since these additional four outputs are ones I'm only interested in at the max, what I'm interested in getting the max value of, 
there's no point in me writing them to the XMDF format, therefore I really do want to avoid adding them to this top map, map output data set that applies globally. Um, I'd much rather overwrite that with the ASCII specific command. And this way, adding these four different outputs in this, this fashion, uh, for this model it only adds 0.15 of a gig to the result folder. Not much at all. Uh, another thing I'd like to bring your attention to is the concept of output zones. This allows you to define um, unique output parameters for a given region or a given zone. I've defined that zone using this po polygon in this file here and I'm outputting XMDF file format for water level velocity and depth every 600 seconds. So much finer than the broader output data set. Uh, you'll find this is useful for targeted animations and also for debugging uh, problem areas in your model. How does this result look? Uh, I've just created an animation of it here. You'll see it's got a much smoother transition of that or progression of that flood wave than the alternative data set that was outputting every hour. Uh, so it's very useful for these targeted analyses. Uh, TUFO has actually produced two files here. It's produced one for the broader study area with an hour increment and then this smaller one as well. The benefit of do doing it this way is that the file associated with the smaller area is only 0.2 of a gig in, fi in file size. If I was to use that same time increment for the whole model, the file would be in the order of 2.8 to 3 gig. Uh, look, finally, the, the last thing I'd like to bring your attention to is where you save your results. Uh, I typically recommend saving them to your local drive and then and maintaining a really good naming convention and modeling log for your, your modeling and only bringing your milestone or delivery results up to your company network, which your company subsequently archives. Um, that way the data footprint of your project as a whole will be much smaller on the archiving system that your company uses. If you have a good modeling log and a good uh, naming convention, you'll be able to recreate any iterative or pr prior iterations of the models um, if needed. Look, so in summary, um, I recommend using the XMDF format for your temporal map output. Definitely don't use ASCII or FLOAT for your, your temporal map output. Uh, those grid formats, that's the ASCII and the FLOAT, should be used for your maximum results. When you are setting your map output, use an appropriate output increment. Um, smaller isn't necessary in most cases. Output zones uh, are something that's very worthwhile familiarizing yourself with. They can be very useful. Similarly, plot output is something that should be used rather than relying on a high temporal map output. And finally, consider how you write your results and which results can be written to your XMDF format, which is typically has a larger file size associated with it, relative to your maximum grid ASCII or float data set. So putting all these things together, you can really create a result data set that's quite compact and small. That concludes today's presentation. If you have any questions, feedback or comments, please email us at support at twoflow.com. Uh, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you and we'll see you next time.